1953, the first released film adaptation of The War of the Worlds, produced by George Powell, entered theatres. But this was not the first endeavour to make a motion picture from H.G. Wells' iconic story. There had been quite a few attempts during the preceding decades that never got off the ground. One of which, however, did actually have quite extensive work done on it. The driving force of one man with the dream of faithfully bringing this story to life on the big screen. Ray Harryhausen was a legend in the film industry. The master of special effects in an era before digital or computer generated imagery was ever a thing. Even if you don't recognise the name, there's a decent chance you'd recognise the incredibly distinctive style of his work. A pioneer in creating one of the earliest successful forms of stop motion animation. A technique he got into after being witness to the initial release of the original 1933 King Kong when he was just 13 years old. A film that's famous for its groundbreaking special effects by Willis O'Brien, including the use of stop motion as well as matte painting, rear projection and miniatures. The young Harryhausen was obsessed with this film because he didn't know how it was done, watching it many times and leading to him eventually finding out more about the methods used. But so much was still unknown to him and as a result he experimented with stop motion in his garage. He eventually started studying art and anatomy at Los Angeles City College, which would lead to him being incredibly proficient in the realism of his models later on, after which he landed his first commercial model animation job in 1940, working with George Powell on his series Puppetoons. Powell became a friend and mentor to Harryhausen. With the United States joining the Second World War, however, he ended up serving in the Army's Special Services Division under legendary director Frank Capra in a variety of roles, including camera assistant. And it was during this time, as early as 1942, that Harryhausen was already thinking about creating a film of what had always been one of his favourite stories, The War of the Worlds. As he said, he'd always wanted to do a project like this, but the idea of filming a Vern or a Well story in my small hobby house studio was not exactly realistic. Only when I found a major studio to provide the finance could I even contemplate that sort of project. It was apparently while in the army that he wrote a rough outline for the story. Being a fan of the book, it's clear he wanted the picture to be faithful to the source material, initially setting it in England and saying, I wanted to keep it in the period that H.G. Wells wrote it, of the Victorian period. After the war, he was hired by his hero, the man behind King Kong, Willis O'Brien, as an assistant animator on what turned out to be Harryhausen's first major film, Mighty Joe Young, also about a giant gorilla, which was released in 1949 after which he immediately began pushing his idea of an adaptation of The War of the Worlds, as he explained in an interview. So right after finishing Mighty Joe Young in 1949, I made 10 big sketches. Just to interrupt here, the number seems to vary. In one interview he said, I made 8 big drawings, some of which are published, while it's also been said that he did a dozen charcoal sketches of main scenes, as well as a storyboard of a scene in which the main character fights one of the Martians in a farmhouse. This discrepancy may be due to some of them not being published, or might be depending on which drawings he's specifically referring to. As he later said, he produced a number of tracings, sketches, key scene storyboards and large key drawings, so there was a lot of types of drawings, so maybe that's why. But anyway, carrying on, he said, I made 10 big sketches and took them around to all the studios, but I couldn't peddle it, I took it all around Hollywood. Paramount owned the rights to the book, and I took it to Jesse Lasky, one of the founders of Paramount. And he was interested, but he had difficulty in raising the money for it. People weren't that interested in science fiction at that time. I even went so far as making a test in 16mm to show what the Martian creatures would look like, all based on H.G. Wells' descriptions. 
and indeed this is perhaps the most extensive piece of work accomplished for this project. If you don't know what stop motion is, it's the process of making tiny movements in articulated models and capturing the changes on a camera one frame at a time. I've actually tried it myself, I forgot about this, but there's some very old, very bad stop motion videos on my channel that I did when I was younger. It's a very difficult process, so this footage might be short, but I'm telling you now it would have taken ages to do this, especially so well. The cylinder here was created from plaster, while the Martian creature was metal armature covered in moulded latex. Interestingly, this could have been even more complicated, as he'd wanted to try out even more techniques for the footage. He said, I was experimenting with split screen in 16mm, I wanted to do a travelling matte composite of people in front of the alien, but it was going to be too complicated and I couldn't do it. An instantly recognisable feature when it comes to the process of stop motion is this signature jittery low frame rate kind of look, and one of the trends I remember seeing a couple of years ago was people taking clips from Harry Harrelson's films and using new frame interpolation technology to make them seem a lot more smoother. This doesn't necessarily make it better, although you might understandably assume that that would be the case. Arguably it takes away from the character of the animation, and having a higher frame rate can actually hinder the look of something. So there's actually lots of nuances, it's not just a numbers game, and Harryhausen clearly meticulously crafted his animations in a very specific way to give them a certain feeling that was intended. That being said, it's still fascinating to see the animations with a higher frame rate, purely out of curiosity, and so I thought I'd give it a go myself. Now this, from what I found, was the best quality of the Martian clip on YouTube, which I thought was a shame that such a low quality rendition was the best on this site. As a result, I scoured the internet and found the best quality of this rare footage I could find, and then I've upscaled it, added sound, and given it 8 times the frames, and this was the result. In the clip, we see how Ray has managed to really nicely portray the creature struggling to breathe before falling down. I think for some reason, every article I read about the footage has said that this is depicting the end of the film when the aliens die. In fact, even this documentary about Harry Harryhausen, narrated by Leonard Nimoy, says, it is of the story's ironic climax, showing the fearsome man from Mars succumbing to an ordinary earthly illness to which he had no immunity. They did not live long and prosper. But of course, it's quite clear that it's actually depicting the beginning of the story, when the Martians first show themselves. As the narrator says in the book, after initially laying eyes on them, those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of its appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of brow ridges, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of this mouth, the gorgon groups of tentacles, the tumultuous breathing of the lungs in a strange atmosphere the evident heaviness and painfulness of movement due to the greater gravitational energy of the Earth. Above all, the extraordinary intensity of the immense eyes were at once vital, immense, inhuman, crippled and monstrous. There was something fungoid in the oily brown skin, 
something in the clumsy deliberation of the tedious movements unspeakably nasty. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and dread. Suddenly the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit with a thud like the fall of a great mass of leather. Wow, is that depiction description accurate? I feel like more so than you'd expect. Maybe it's just me, but when I first saw these designs, I wasn't so sure about them at first, to be honest. Harryhausen depicts the Martians in a way that I don't think has ever really been done before. I'm not entirely sure how to describe what I mean, but I'll try anyway. I guess it's kind of cartoonish or something, with those big eyes. It's been noted in the documentary that he made them seem very sympathetic looking, so maybe that's it. Or maybe it's just unusual to me to see the text so literally taken to visual form. Arguably, this is likely the most faithful rendition in terms of bringing to life exactly what's on the page. In his own words, I followed Wells' description, perhaps a tad too closely. He would later say, looking at it today, this creature is unimpressive and totally wrong. One of the reasons for this view seemingly being Harryhausen's meticulous obsession with ensuring realism in the details of his models. When creating something purely from the imagination, he was incredibly specific about making his designs realistic and feasible in order for the audiences to believe the fabrication that they saw on the screen. As a result, he preferred to follow certain rules of logic, such as the idea that, without hands, and in particular the evolution of the opposable thumb, it is obvious that human beings could not have developed technologically, culturally, and artistically in the way we have. So if one creates an alien with only a tentacle or a forked pincer-like hand, audiences may legitimately ask how such creatures would be able to design and construct vehicles capable of transporting them to Earth or indeed anywhere else. When designing the tentacled Martians, this created an impasse that he resolved with somewhat of a compromise. He dispensed of his favoured logic in favour of accuracy to the book, but gave the ends of their tentacles two digits. It seems that he was never truly content with this, however, and he theorised that one of the reasons he considered the design to be totally wrong is maybe because its two digits would never have allowed it to build the spacecraft, let alone the war machines, but also because it would have been unacceptable as a terrifying alien invader because it wasn't scary enough. Today I think I might change the concept, because the octopus-like creatures that come out for tripods might get a laugh. This is definitely understandable, and I would agree it's easy to see how these Martians could be considered kind of comical looking. Yet, despite what now may be thought of the portrayal, I think it definitely suits the time it was done, and I don't think it would have been out of place at all in the era in which Ray created it. This Martian is so incredibly distinctively in his style, and honestly, I can definitely picture this as having been a faithfully produced film. Like, he's done such a good job of showing what this could have been. I can totally imagine it having existed as yet another Ray Harryhausen classic. The great trouble he was having getting a studio to put up the money to produce a film likely influenced his decision to relocate it to the contemporary United States instead, presumably with the intention of bringing it more in line with the at the time relatively recent Orson Welles radio broadcast that had done the same and was very highly well known with the great amount of publicity it achieved. It was also likely, for money reasons, it would presumably be cheaper to set it in the current day America than Victorian England. Just like the broadcast, the Martians would now invade New York City, as shown beautifully in ruins or inhabited with dead tripods in the art. To further connect the two adaptations, this version would now steal Professor Pearson from the broadcast, Orson Welles' combined replacement for the narrator and Ogilvy. Meanwhile, Ray created a new main character for the story to follow, a newspaper reporter, who was apparently going to be called Randy Jordan. Despite these changes seemingly made to revitalise the project into being more attractive to Hollywood studios, there was still a lack of interest in it. 
and Harryhausen was trying to figure out where to find someone who would get the War of the Worlds made. According to the archives of warofthewelders.co.uk, in October 1950, while visiting his old army colonel Frank Capra, the subject turned to that of George Powell's latest film, Destination Moon. This science fiction film caused Harryhausen to suddenly realise that Powell, who was at Paramount Pictures that owned the rights to make a film of the War of the Worlds, might just be the perfect person to take on his idea for the project. As a result, Ray met up with George, showing him his material, and the two spoke for many hours about the project, with the latter asking how long it would take to animate. Power suggested that he had heard that Fox and RKO were already working on a film of The War of the Worlds, but suggested that Ray leave his material with him, and he would try to get interest for it from the front office. A few days later, Ray discovers that George Powell had himself already been negotiating with Paramount to make the film, with Powell admitting to him personally several weeks later that he was already working on it. Seemingly as a consolation, Powell hinted that he might make a film of Tom Thumb, utilising Harryhausen's techniques. While Powell did do this film a few years later, Harryhausen wasn't involved. Despite this whole situation, Ray was always very diplomatic when talking about it, and they remained good friends. Although Ray did speak about the 1953 War of the Worlds, saying, I also showed the test footage to George Powell, long before he made his version of the story. Powell made his picture as an up-to-date modern version, while I wanted to keep it in the Victorian period, because you run into this problem in the present day of using the atomic bomb, then you destroy everything and there's nothing left to photograph. Although Ray getting beats to the first film adaptation of The War of the Worlds is generally considered the nail in the coffin of this project, he actually continued for many decades to try and get it done, up through even to the 1970s apparently. In one attempt he said, I finally wrote a letter to Orson Welles because I thought maybe he'd like to make the movie and I wanted to show the test footage to him, but I never received an answer. Later on we were going to get Orson Welles to do the voice of the Oracle in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad in 1973, but at the last minute he doubled his fee. Which I think in the context of this interview, he's implying that he may have been intending to show Welles the footage had they worked together. Interestingly, it was at around this same time that in the film F for Fake, Orson Welles actually used footage of flying saucers that Harryhausen had animated for the film Earth vs. the Flying Saucers in order to represent his own radio broadcast of the War of the Worlds in this docudrama. Of this, Orson Welles said, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, that is such a funny looking film. Of course, we sped it up a little and made it look even more ridiculous. I'm perfectly happy to use anybody's film that's around. That was the point of that. Although Harryhausen never got to make his War of the Worlds, he did eventually get to make a H.G. Wells film adaptation of his 1901 novel The First Men in the Moon. This film, which depicts the first moon landing half a decade before the actual first moon landing, is a great example of Harryhausen's detailed work. When designing the film sets, he used NASA blueprints as inspiration for the UN's lunar lander in the film. The screenwriter Nigel Neal says that he decided to change the ending of the story for the film, so spoiler alert. While the moon is shown inhabited by a race known as the Selenites, designed by Ray, Neil knew that a country would get to the moon soon after the film was released and discover that there were no such inhabitants. As a result, he says he admittedly took directly from the War of the Worlds the idea that they were all wiped out by a cold virus. This is about as close as Ray Harryhausen ever got to making his War of the Worlds adaptation, which is quite a shame as he apparently always regretted never being able to get it off the ground. Ray later said of his project, It would have been an interesting picture if it was made years ago, but since then so many pictures of that nature have been made that it wouldn't be quite unique as it would have been. 
It makes you wonder if we had gotten that version, would Paramount still have done George Powell's iconic adaptation as well? I guess probably not, but I feel like they're so distinct from each other that they both easily could have existed concurrently as distinctly eminent entities. Though I guess the real winner of this whole consideration is H.G. Wells. Like you've got this situation where it's as if there's parallel universes, but no matter what one you go to, there's a film of the War of the Worlds that's an absolute masterpiece. George Powell certainly is, and it's fair to say Ray Harryhausen's likely would have been as well. I think that says a lot about how good the original story is itself. It's been said that this unrealised film may have been one of the greatest science fiction motion pictures of all time. For all we know, it might have been. Either way, I think it's fair to say the unfulfilment of this project is at the very minimum a great shame. But at least we have so much material of it still surviving that we can enjoy. It certainly would have been interesting if we lived in a world where an additional theatrical film adaptation existed and we got to experience Ray Harryhausen's The War of the Worlds.